It's the groundwork. This should complete the groundwork for the first lecture. And uh, <clears throat> this part is clear. That part about genetics is clearly very interesting to me because what got me into this is my special needs son, really. <laughs> it's a crazy story if we can talk about it. <clears throat> but I was looking for a solution. How is he doing that? He's doing well. He walks without any braces and he can run. He's pretty functional for uh, the avatar body that he got. It makes me feel very lucky. <laughs> okay, so let's, we're going to go over a little bit of the astronomical evidence of the Anunnaki on Earth. Some of the great documents. The documents are just prolific. There's tens of thousands of them. Everything from marriage records to land contracts to discussions about the gods. And I have to tell you, uh, one of the key sources that I used, and we'll get to this, was some of the research done at the University of Philadelphia at the turn of the century. So there was a German individual getting his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania who was a sumerologist. Okay? They went to Babylon, recovered several of the um, cuneiform tablet, kind of like these etchings, what Merle Green did, got copies of them, photographic plates, and then brought them back and decoded them. So reading through all those documents, apart from what Sitchin did, apart from what everybody did, listen, this went on to the turn of the century. Okay, so this stuff's been around. The problem is not too many people could read it, right? So the mysterious language, like the Mayan codex. And I want to tell you that Pearl Green that was on this property, who did these etchings, was a significant artist who helped recreate these ancient sites because she was trained as a draftsman. And I had an artist that could recreate these for the archaeologists and brought it to life, brought a lot of interest to what happened here, right here at Chichen Itza. That's why this gallery is dedicated to her. Okay. These are these are rubbings. Yeah, these are rubbings also. Okay. And while we're talking about people connected to Chichen Itza, I find Tatiana Perovovich, if I'm saying her name right. Does anybody know how that's actually pronounced? <laughs> I just call it Tatiana, okay? She was a Russian woman who was going head to head with some of the key sumerologists here in the United States, okay? Academics, you know how the academic controls them. And one of the academics in the United States is an old guy, I won't spare his name right now, but he told Tatiana, you'll never decode this stuff. It's, it's, it's just, it's undecipherable, okay? Well, she took that as a challenge, landed in Palenque, and started looking at the glyphs, lining them in time, correlating them with birth, death, rulership. The next thing you know, she had come up with a very large table explaining all the edifices of the statues that were in line in Palenque. She gave this document to, I think his name was uh, Thompson. She gave this document to him, and by the next day, he recanted his position and realized she had done it. That's why the name of my room was dedicated to her, because she was on this property as well. So she was seminal in breaking the Mayan codex. Now, there were two other people. The first one, um, it was a woman out of the Smithsonian. I'm having trouble remembering her name, but it's on a Nova special, decoding the Mayan uh, codex. She worked with a very young boy who was named David Sweeney. He actually was practically in diapers accompanying his father, who was an archaeologist, down at Palenque and various sites in Mexico, making drawings of the different uh, codices because they were trying to break this language. And he turned out to be a genius as he grew up. And he was seminal in taking Tatiana's work and truly illuminating the mind codex, and he broke that code. So he, he is a really important person as well, David Sweeney. And so, Part of the reason we chose this site, sans air conditioning, that we didn't know <laughs> was because of those people that traversed this property and did what they did to bring this, this knowledge to all of us. Evidence of Anunnaki on Earth. <clears throat> we had astronomical documentaries, sculptures, building, mining, and genetics. And if you're not looking for this, you wouldn't know to correlate it with the Akrahasis, the Intermediate, and everything that went on in the past. But if you're looking for it, you need to realize it. It, it's, it's very, it's very clear. Oh, by the way, that's the Iraqi Dinar. You saw how tall the bee that was sitting on, sitting on the chair there? Go back to it. Let me go back. He's sitting. This one is. Okay. 
So when I first wrote the Anunnaki Guru, most of my sales were happening in the Middle East, under Middle East history. Because they knew, they knew about these beings. And it was just amazing that I was having these conversations with these people about, yeah, it's obvious to us. Not in the West, it wasn't. Okay. As an engineer in 2002, when I was told to take a hiatus by the venture capitalists at this telecom company, where do you start? Where do you start unraveling this mystery? Hopefully you can glean something from people you trust in the past, but as an engineer, I have to be honest with you, I thought history was just a bunch of crap written by the victors, because in most cases it didn't hold water. It's like too many contradictions. Okay? So I was never interested in history until I started doing business in Turkey and started getting on this story. And I've always been on a truth quest my whole life, like probably most of you. But this is where, this was the question for me. Where do I start? So, I was reading Guns, Germs, and Steel while on my way to Turkey, again, on another flight. I went over there a lot. And I thought, well, let's start with the oldest structure from a technology standpoint. Uh, we knew about Rebecca Kepi. Actually, they just discovered Rebecca Kepi when I was over there. But we knew about Papahayuk that was older than Jericho. I was like, really? This stuff's getting older than the Bible now. What about Mesopotamia, 3800 BC, Egypt, 3100 BC? And all of a sudden, it's staring me right in the face. I'm in a country where they have artifacts that are much older than that. So I'm like, okay, there's something wrong here. We're not being told the truth. Uh, later on, as I was researching, the connection into Africa, which came from the Atrahasis, told us they were down in Africa mining gold. The, the, uh, the stone calendars started showing up and all these stone edifices, and we'll talk about that. So, so I was drawn to structures at first, initially, because those are things you could see, but ultimately there were, there were more places to start. I wanted to know the first writing, because we could see that cognates and borrowing and lexicons were coming from older languages and ending up in all the other Semitic languages and the ones that came after. So what was the first one? I wanted to know. Was it Egyptian hieroglyphs? Was it the Mayan Codex? Was it, you know, what was it? So these are the things that were going through my mind when I started this path. <clears throat> and yeah, you can interpret, interpret rocks and structures to a certain degree, but you can see the archaeologists uh, basically create a story to tell the story of the stones and bones. Because there's not there's not writing there. If there's not writing there to tell it. And uh, it's very hard to date a stone. Okay? You can do carbon material and things, but it's very hard to date a stone. So the idea of <clears throat> using archaeoastronomy and all that was very attractive to me because I realized that was very powerful for dating these structures, especially the equinox and solstice temples that we knew we could go up Google Sky or any of the other tools, wind history back, see where the planets were in the sky, and go, okay, that's what they were looking at. Down this marker stone to figure out what time it was. Why did it matter? Recall that we, that I stated one of the principles was it was very clear that at zodiac house changes, the Anunnaki Council changed. And that had big impacts for the primitive workers on this planet. And whether it was an anti or animal life, what level of abuse or empowerment they got to achieve a higher level of consciousness. So this war over the evolution of consciousness is still going on today. Do you know if anybody had uh, broken the code for the Indus uh, languages? The Arapa and the Mahajagara? Let's let's talk about it break, okay? Otherwise it might be wrong. <laughs> but yeah, it's a very interesting source, especially in Mahajagara. Yeah, but have anybody broken the code or not? You, you know, not, not that I know of right now. Okay. So, here was a picture of Papa Hayek while I was in Turkey <clears throat> that they were excavating this. Um, very complex structure, but not nearly as strange as Rebecca's Pepe, right? <laughs> if somebody here said they had just been, you've been there. What, what did you guys think of Rebecca's Pepe? Were you impressed? Uh, Did you tell us a story? Did you I was really impressed, and I the, the story was very hard to figure out. But, yeah. but I mean, I know from other lecturers that the same symbols you see on the stones are turning up 
in different places. Exactly. Um, exactly. The, well, I noticed that as well. And I was like, okay, whose symbols are they? Who are the gods for the Hittites and the Hattusa and so on and so forth? And I started looking in Turkey while I was there and like, they, these seem to have share attributes for what we're seeing over in Mesopotamia. What's yeah, the connection? They were talking about, um, yeah, uh, Pumapunku and Pumapunku, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the same, the, the, the statue there in the middle has the same hands and the same belt that one of those uh, pylons had. Well, actually, what you bring up is a very good point. Because what I discovered, without getting too deep into the Gobekli Tepe, and it goes back about 12,000 yeah. years ago. Well, this is right when the last Aes Age is, right? So they may have had reason for burying that city and preserving it before they came back, right? So I was thinking about that. And also finding out who the gods were to the Hittites connected exactly over to the end of the line client. Because the Iskaradad was their storm god under Hattusa. Very interesting. <laughs> so all of a sudden I'm going, wait, my Mesopotamian research is extending over here into Turkey. So a lot of people haven't made that connection, but I did it all the time ago. Here's some of the uh, stone circles and calendar artifacts that were found in there's my telemetry down in Africa. Okay, so this was called Adam's Calendar. This got me real excited, actually. <laughs> that it looked like the Sumerian story that was told in the Atrahasis actually did occur in Africa, just like they said. So I, so I started going, okay, well, looks like Africa is going to be the oldest. You know, I thought it was going to be Egypt or Sumeria. But it kept going back in time. That's on the same note as uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so under the documentary evidence, we have various languages around the world that I could look at. I knew the Indus Valley it was at least 2,900 years old, but we had evidence that Mohenjo-Daro and other cities in India were even older than that. So the Indian culture was very ancient. So here's an example of the uh, uniform code script that you can download on your computer in hexadecimal code showing the rows and columns of all the symbols in cuneiform. Okay? And similarly, they have for other languages. So ultimately, you need a list of all the symbols for a language, assign them some code, and then you start breaking it apart in a, like a decipher. Those are hard to see. I think it's here. So, which was the first language? And that was important to me because it didn't look like we had a lot of documentary evidence from Africa in terms of writing. But we did as you went to these other parts of the world. So I was like, okay, the story is all there from Samaria, We're talking about these players. Here's the language that they started with. And it evolved, it didn't start out like that, but it evolved uh, over time. Does everybody know what Kimi from is? Pretty much, okay. It's a very easy thing to do to take a stylus that has a triangular shaped wedge and push it on a wet clay without dragging it. If you drag it, you're going to pull part of the clay out and mess up the script, right? So it's like a pressing, like a almost. So the idea of taking a cylinder seal that has some language or symbols on it and rolling it across wet clay makes a lot of sense because it's using the same principle of an indentation, whether reverse image or the other. One. So what do, we, what do we know? We know that in Egypt and Mesopotamia, that the calendar, language, and writing came from a particular individual in their culture, and that was Thoth. And here's Isis over here. So all of a sudden, well, wait, did cuneiform come from Thoth? Did hieroglyphs come from Thoth? Ultimately, in the city of Larsa in Mesopotamia, they could contribute that city to the place of writing and language. So all of a sudden, now you're in a pre-diluvial city of the Anunnaki in between the Tigris and Euphrates. And I'm like, hmm, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Mexico, they, like we said, they ultimately ended up with codices that ended up being able to be decoded and told family lineages and stories. And a lot of this is available now that you can read this. And as a matter of fact, I was telling somebody, one of the guides was sharing with you that there are over two million people that speak Mayan now. And they're also teaching how to read the Mayan Codex and their script in schools. So I think that's, that's really an amazing thing to preserve their culture. It's mandatory. 
Oh, is it? In this hand, the UB10? Yeah, yeah, it's mandatory and it's free. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, they're working very hard to preserve that culture. I think yes. it's a, I think it's an amazing thing. Uh, I'm going to switch over. I'm going to do astrological evidence for it, and then we're going to kind of go heavy into the documentary evidence. So, from an astrological uh, standpoint, in 1976, uh, Zechariah Sitchin wrote. The, uh, it should have been 76. Sorry, he pointed. He wrote a book called The Twelfth Planet, where he had looked at these Sumerian documents and tried to put together. The, the best story he could based on the evidence. And he's been lambasted for, you know, making one minor mistake here or there. You know, so there's always the ax at the base of the tree to chop down anybody that's threatening academia. Well, he was one of them. He was very much like uh, Heinrich Sleeman. Does anybody know who he is? He actually proved the existence of Troy on the Sea of Marmara in Turkey. He wasn't an archaeologist, and the academics lambasted him for doing it. Well, he turned out to be right, and some of those academics ended up committing suicide because they had made absolute fools of themselves. Okay, so, so as far as the letters behind their name and giving them credentials to it, no, it's what's between here and what's in here to illuminate the truth to me, and that's what I connect. With. So, when I read this old man's books, and I know some of you have read all of this stuff, I did not perceive a lying, cheating, manipulating Mason the way he's been portrayed. Okay. He told the story the best he could from the documents. And when you read it, it's very difficult to read all of them. But you'll realize this, this guy put it out there for humanity. And, and he really has not been honored correctly for it, I don't think. Another astrological point of evidence. Oh, by the way, so what did he do? He started talking about this 12th planet that he saw on, cylinder, on a cylinder seal, VA-243, plus the other evidence that he had. Okay. Dr. Harrington, later on, from the Naval Observatory, as of about 19, shortly after reading Sitch's book, they got together. And he did some corroborating as well. And I'm going to go over that in detail and I can move forward. Okay. So, what else do we have? Ask a lot. Oh, I want to play this actually. So, this is, has everybody seen this segment where those two met at the Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C.? And we're talking about their orbital charge relative to the Sumerian account from the Enuma Elish and what they had done with the IRA scope. What's that black and white? What's that? Black and white video? No, I think it's still up. How do you see that? They're sitting in an office? Okay. Yeah, actually, they're, uh, they're in. Um, let me make sure I don't have that slide. Yeah. Uh, so, so, we talked about the Enuma Elish real quickly. And I actually did two versions of it. My first book. I did a version and a decoding of it. And then in my second book, I actually went even further to give you Nishida's perspective relative to Pioneer Mercury because he was involved. When NASA launched the Pioneer 10 spacecraft in 1972, it attached to it a golden plaque. With this plaque, Pioneer carries a message to extraterrestrials about its home planet. Its symbols show the radio signature of our sun, where our planet is located, and what we looked like. As Pioneer 10 journeys on beyond the outer known planets, the data it is sending back is also being used to seek a possible 10th planet. Indeed, a March 1992 NASA press release stated, Unexplained deviations in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune point to a large outer solar system body of four to eight Earth masses on a highly tilted orbit beyond seven billion miles from the Sun. In the past two decades, astronomers have joined the search to look for one more planet in our own solar system. They designate such a planet, Planet X, meaning both unknown and tenth. of their discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but, and you're absolutely right. And as a matter of fact, the date on here, I was just noticing is um, 
14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet to be discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system and this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing and that's when you you sent me this book you have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some 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 time ends ago uh, of, of a, a celestial body which you I think named in the a paper, uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or, or, or somehow uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escape satellite of Neptune. This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. We'll take the orbit of the satellite near Reed and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. And uh, we've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune, we actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture, at least in your own mind, of what we are talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh... Well, if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if, if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600 year orbit, then it's, its mass would be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto. And this here is the orbit that I have proposed for on the 10th planet, and here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet, yes. and uh, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in biblical time, and that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now. Very similar area for it, and they had uh, a lot of uh, information from these probes that they sent out to corroborate or deny of the existence. Well, I'll let you be the judge after we do the Google Orbital Report update on what you think. Okay? <laughs> and another thing about the new image that I wanted to bring out was some of the sophisticated things that went on in that account couldn't even be understood until we achieved the scientific understanding where we are now in terms of some of the things that they did. They had energy weapons that they claimed could split a planet. So it's like, well, this one's in our way. We're going inbound, so bye-bye. Things like that. Masking the radiance of a planet. Well, how do you mask the radiance of a planet like the sun? They were talking about that in the Indian Village. Very, very interesting. <clears throat> now, that was the 
That's when he was young. <laughs> Doesn't look like that. He actually died of a rapid onset of cancer, much like many of the other pioneers did in this space. And we'll talk about the report. It's very disturbing. Okay, well, let's go into a little bit more astrological evidence. So now we've got the U.S. Naval Observatory's top scientists way back in 78 looking for this planet because they knew from the 1700s something big had to perturb those big outer planets. And it wasn't Pluto. We didn't find that until 1930. And that was a, a guy named Thompson, I believe, that did that. Okay? And he was also involved with uh, this search. <laughs> Now, okay. Well, okay. Well, when we do the new girl orbital update, we'll, we'll talk about all these details. Okay? But I want you to give you an idea of what people have been doing all the way back to the turn of the 19th century, looking for this planet. Okay? There were lots of press reports that came out, a mysterious planet showing its orbits. And if you go back in my report, I had a link. There were hundreds and hundreds of articles that had been posted since the 50s. Every year you'd see new stuff coming out. As, our, as we got more technically advanced, they got more focused on finding it. And, you know, did they have the capability of super cooling an instrument in order to see something in, in the infrared in the 50s? It doesn't look like they did. Not until Harrington showed up. And that was something that really broke open this whole space. And this one goes back to 1981. There was several of them in 1981. Five, actually five of them at that time. And I read some of them, and they are all basically introducing this concept of a, a rogue invading planet that <coughs> could have tilted these huge planets off their ecliptical orbit with the sun into an orbit where they still are today. So they're looking at what, you know, what could have caused that? Was it a collision? Was it a gravitational effect from a passing body? And this has been a mystery for a very, very long time. It's not new. <laughs> so some of the cultural proofs from Sumeria are absolutely amazing. You realize that in 3800 BC, the civilization popped up in Mesopotamia, and it wasn't the first time, by the way. Remember I told you Eridu was one of the pre-diluvial cities, the first one that we know of on this planet by the Anunnaki. Could there have been other races built in Gatherwork? Possibly. But we know that city was built, according to the Enuma Illich, way back, or the Atacasis, way back, almost 400,000 years ago, if that's when Enki came, right? And he set up the city just like he said. So I'll show you some pictures of Ridu in just a little while. It's actually quite amazing that that wasn't the number one archaeological site on this planet. It's still sitting there covered up with dirt. It's unbelievable. Um, so the, absolute first that came out of Samaria. Now, I want to give you a little comparison. About 12,000 years, or actually 18,000 years ago in southern France, in the caves of Glasgow, people were still making their clothing out of animal skin, and the most advanced thing they had was looked like a bone needle before they could stitch a button on it. Okay? There wasn't any writing. There were some drawings in the caves. But these were primitive beings, barbarians, if you will, according to Paul, living in caves. Fast forward about 15,000 years, all of a sudden you have this civilization in Sumer that pops up, 3800 BC. They've got astronomy, language, law codes, law, mathematics, music, advanced current precipitation, civilized cities with running hot and cold water, sewage disposal. Where did they get that? How did that happen? In, in geological time, the existence of humans on this planet is a blip in geological time. And we know it takes a long time if you sign up to this iterative knowledge accumulation of humans to advance. It doesn't happen overnight like that. So it, Sumer has always been an anomaly to archaeology. They just could not understand how a complete civilization showed up like that. And actually, according to Noah Craig, who's the premier Sumerologist, over 100 firsts that we're still using in culture today came from the Samaritans. So they weren't primitive. So here's some of their building structures in uh, Iraq. 
really quite amazing, these stepped pyramids. Sound familiar? Uh, this particular tablet, which tells the story of the man's creation from Otter Hastis' viewpoint, stored in the British Museum. You can go see it today. So these aren't tucked away somewhere. Luckily, they ended up in a place where our, those who followed behind, the people who spent the time in the dirt digging this stuff up, would have a chance to see it. For good or ill, whether you view that as uh, stealing from a, a culture to preserve it. Now consider what's going on in Iraq right now with all these Sumerian tablets, structures, statues being torn down right now. It's like, wow, really? So, these, uh, this document I mentioned to you, and you're going to see that as we go into decoding cuneiform here in just a minute. Okay, so they did a good job at contributing to this process. I'm going to talk a little bit about this famous cylinder seal, very controversial in terms of showing that there was a 10th planet in our solar system that the Anunnaki knew about. And this is what uh, ended up being such a controversial thing for Zechariah Sitchin as he got attacked by the likes of should I say his name? Michael Heiser, for instance, who has a website, a disparaging website where an old hero wrote almost 15 books calling SitchinIsWrong.com. Now you imagine somebody opening a website to be a contrarian as a researcher, supposedly with a PhD, doing that to another person. You don't cut another man's tree down or break his cup to make yours bigger. If you do, you're probably a sick fan or a thief. And I, my spirit rises up with my hack is staggered back in that when I see that kind of behavior, I don't like it. So I don't normally mention his name. And the fact that he's done that, coming from a Hebrew background, is his training. I ought to tell you about Enlil and Enki's information war that's going on relatively true. Uh, one of the other really famous documents, for those who know about King Gilgamesh from the city of Uruk, is one of the longest written epics, along with the Arabian Nights, right? Uh, is located in the British Museum, so you can see it today. Uh, now the fun starts. You guys ready? All right. We're going to leave, learn to read cutie form. Okay? Okay. So here's an example of some of the cutie form. And it turned out that there were several symbols that were both pictogram and phonemes that could be combined. Similar with what happened in the Mayan language. It wasn't just pictographic, it was also phonic. Okay? So here you can see you have a symbol for something, but down here you might have a a script that is a phony that could be used to spell something else. So they're mixed together, that happens. And here's it. So you, and there, we actually have a dictionary too, as well, of most of the words that have been converted, so you can get it today. I have it. This was one of my favorite documents. It put me over the edge with documentary evidence. Didn't have to do with Sitchin, didn't have to do with the Sumerologists, none of those. It had to do with Herman Grant who was a PhD student in 1909. How did you use the dictionary? The dictionary? I'll, I'll share it with you. I had a PDF of a dictionary that was not as very good. So, in this document, they went to Babylon, got a bunch of cutie form tablets, copied them, and then started decoding them. And the process of decoding is in the document as part of this guy's PhD research. And it made me realize that I could read this too. It just takes time. And eventually, if you can come up with all the symbols and the phonemes, get it in your computer, then with our optical character recognition, you can digitize these things and have it translated automatically. That's what we're doing now. Okay? So this whole issue with translation, it's a red herring. Okay? And there are hundreds of thousands of these things, and only about 30,000 have actually been converted to my knowledge. There's a lot more. Okay? So, uh, this was the first dynasty of Babylon. Babylon. Sippar was a very important pre diluvial city. Okay? And we're we're going to talk a little bit about those when we get to that. Uh, according to their records, that's where their landing site was for the first approach axis between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Nippur was the mission control headquarters, the location of the Bon Heaven Earth communications back in the group. That's what they meant when they called it Bon Heaven Earth. Okay? So all of a sudden, we got some documents right out of the place where it was all going down. 
names of the gods, the whole thing goes in there. So here's a picture of some of the tablets. There's the front, the reverse, and then the right edge. Okay? So there's obverse, reverse, left edge, and then the uh, no, wait, the right edge. Okay? So that's the script there. Now, if you get to this point, you can run OCR on it. Okay? Today. Okay. So the next thing we need, if we're going to decode this, is we need the full list of the signs, like I told you. So that's the first thing Herman Racky did, was go through these tablets and see if he could come up with a complete list of the signs. So this is what it looks like. You can see his notes in this column here, and the translation over here. This one, that is a pictogram that spells Marduk. That's an Anarsin. There's Nergal. Nergal was one of Anvil's kids. Okay? Ninsun. Nimartsaw. He Arash. This is the woman that Anu had a child with that had Enlil. That was his mother. So this got really, made it very real to me. <laughs> These guys, independent of all the other research, had done this way back then. All right, so I'm going to give you kind of a list, not that we're going to dwell on this, but we're going to figure out how to make this stuff available to you without sending my intellectual property all over the world, okay? We're going to figure that out for you. So you can see starting here in hexadecimal code at 1200 to 120FF, okay? There's the whole rows of columns, the first sets of symbols, and this ended up in this uniform standard code in 1991 when they first put this together. You can download this for your computer, okay? So you can write today in cuneiform if you want to. Make your friends go, what? <laughs> so the continuation. So I'm going to just show them all to you without spending a lot of time. I have a few of these, sir. Okay. And actually, you'll see at the end that these particular ones spell out the phonemes in the name of group. Spell out the website? They spell out three different segments of the name Nin Big Group. Okay. So. I know that's a little hard to see. And there's two more of them. Okay, there should be, that uh, should be all. Okay, so this is the end of the symbols. And it ends right on row E and column 1236. And that's in hexadecimal code. And everybody knows what that is, right? <clears throat> okay, so now that you have that, what you need is how these things are combined. Okay, so we started at 1,200 like we did at the table, and now you can see these, these decodings led to the dictionary. So these, if you look through them, okay, so this one right here, oh, that's really not the same. It's even worth fucking music. No, I know, that's worth it's even worth music. I'm sorry. Well, when I get to the end, we can be able to see it clearly. Okay. okay, so all over decodes, you can read how they get combined to form this language. Remember the last two? I think I made a separate slide so you can see that. Okay. And there's the, five, there's the very last one. See? Here for sign E L U M. That's a nice picture of a Okay. So I took these out of there so you can see them blown up. I know it's hard to see. So here's the 1224C is the hexadecimal code. For that symbol, it's translated as knee. Okay. This is a possible way to decode the language. Also, you could find out that there was a pictogram that spelled that out exactly. So instead of spelling it with the phonemes, you may have had a pictogram, especially for the chief gods and certain planets. Okay. 12049 is DI, okay, and it looks like that. And then 12292 is Ru, so when you spell it, Nibiru. Okay. So I give you kind of uh, some of the different names that each of those could mean in different contexts. Just like any language, you could have one phoneme used in another word that meant something different. Well, that's what David Sweeney figured out with the Mayan Codex. That's how he broke that code. They had lots of liberty to choose conjugates and such, and it was done in an artistic way, depending on how the guy felt like writing that day. And that's why Thompson thought they would never decode it. Sweeney proved him wrong. 
Okay. This is the dictionary I was telling you about. I really like this one. And here's the link to it, in case you guys want to get a snapshot of it or whatever. That link will take you to this free PDF that's quite complete. And I've, I've looked at it several times, and I haven't found too many inconsistencies, but I think they did a very good job. Yep. Oh, you can leave it there for a second. <laughs>